on the pulsar population to extract as much information as possible and to see if there is new relevant information that, that is hidden. So, well, the, the data frame uh, we have been working with consists of 2,500 main pulsar. This is the version B1.67 of the ETNIC catalog. This is the version until March 2022. So where are we consider all the pulsar listed in the ATNF catalog, including radio pulsar, gamma ray pulsar, uh, S-ray pulsar, magnetar. But the idea is that we are going to consider only those pulsars with now and spin and spin period derivative, and the spin period de de derivative larger than zero. So if you do that, uh, you obtain 2,509 pulsar, which has 2,242 around isolated pulsar and 267. Uh, binary pulsars. The, the main point here is we are going to apply all this method uh, without making any distinction between the pulsar we are considering. So well, here this is the, this guy is the PP dot diagram. This is the classic way to visualize the, the pulsar population. And we know that is really useful, but we are going to try to, to, to give other way to do the same thing. So, well, regarding the variables we are going to consider, uh, we are going to take into account the dipole model as the scenario, as the best scenario to, to define this variable, this variable, because we know that this scenario works uh, quite well. So, as you see here, uh, there are eight variables, and six of them depend directly on the spin period and the spin period derivative. So, uh, as we know that the spin period, the spin period, and the spin period derivative uh, are known for the for the pulsar we are considering, we will have no problems uh, with the with the rest of the variables. So this is something to to take into account here. So well, a, a few comments on this variable we are we are uh, taking into account. So well, here uh, for example, uh, we add certain magnetic field and the spin down energy uh, load rate because. We think that they are really, really important if you want to characterize the pulsar energy, but also the magnetic field of the pulsar. This is something that you can see when you take the magnetic field at the line cylinder. This is uh, really crucial if you want to incorporate the fact that the, the similar pulsar can have a uh, similar magnetosphere. But also one example about these variables, if you, if you want to see what happened with the variety that you can find when you when you take the uh, electromagnetic configuration, uh, can be useful to, to take uh, the surface electric voltage and the Gorey Julian carry as variables to, to see that thing. So well, with this in with this thing in, uh, in mind, uh, you can ask yourself what, what happened with the rest of the value. Why not consider other properties? Well, the main point here is like um, uh, we want to cut as many parts as possible. So most of the variables you you see here in this slide. They are unknown for the most of the pulsar we have in the ETNIF catalog. So this is something uh, really important here because uh, with this is approach uh, related to to the to the tool we are considering, uh, the best option is probably uh, to get uh, the bigger size that you can. So this is kind of the 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 thing that we are considering to to choose the variable. But also, as you see here. We can consider variables that are, they are extrinsic properties, but you are going to obtain the same thing. You, you will see that uh, they are in so how uh, reducing the, the, the data that you can you can obtain. So well, regarding the, uh, the variables that we are considering, uh, I would like to, to, to show you how we are uh, we, we were uh, able to, to deal with them. So as you know, if you see the variables uh, uh, that we are talking, uh, I, I was talking to, I was talking about. Uh, the problem with them is the the order of magnitude between these variables, uh, um, uh, between these values. So if you take log uh, of these variables, uh, you can uh, facilitate uh, uh, the usage of them. So with, if you take the bar the log of these variables, you can obtain this distribution. We consider that the distribution are asymmetric distribution. So this is something really crucial because now uh, we are going to uh, use uh, this technique to normalize them. And this technique is based on the Q1, Q2, and Q3, uh, Q3 uh, which are the, the, the first quartiles of the distribution. This is the robust scalar. Uh, we think that these parameters uh, define a uh, better uh, uh, the the asymmetric distribution. So this is the reason to to take a look at the 
at the behavior of the distribution we have. So respect to this, this is the a technique that we are going to 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 apply because within this uh, the principal components analysis is very useful because it's a technique that is able to reduce the dimensionality of your problem, but it's able to do that uh, without losing uh, information of your data. So this is this point is is really important here because if you reduce the dimensionalities, uh, you are seeking to lower computational cost. But also uh, here, uh, here in this point, uh, we were asking uh, what happened with the variables we are considering because, as I said, we have eight variables, but uh, there are six variables depending literally on the first two one spin and spin period derivative. The derivative. So the point here is that you know that if you take log of these variables and you apply the PC method, uh, you will obtain a uh, two principal components, two new variables to reproduce the 100% of your data. But the point here is to see if these two PCs, these two principal components uh, are literally a spin and a spin period derivative. The answer is not. So you need to, the, the point here is like a, when you take a, a spin and a spin period derivative cannot reproduce the same information as you, as you see when you, when you use uh, eight variables. So this is something to, to, to keep in mind. So, well, before we go further, I would like to, to explain a little bit how the, the PC method works. So here, if you want to, with this a small example, so if you want to describe the, the shape of a fish, uh, you can take two variables, height and width. So these variables are uh, half a strong correlation between each other. So the PC method try to reproduce the the most of the variant that you see here in this cloud of points by using only one single component. So in somehow the PC method tried to transform the old axis into new ones. So these new ones axis uh, uh, capture the, the, the information that you have in your data, but it, trying to get as less variables as possible. So in this first one uh, component that you see here, this is the blue line, Cut to the most of it of the port of the information that you have in your in your data. If with the second one uh, gets the 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 remaining variant that you have in in your data points. So this is kind of the idea behind the the PC method. In a very detail, the PC method uh, works in this way. Uh, it, it it gets the 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 clouds of points and try to maximize the dispersion of your data driving different lines and get the, 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 the best one. The best one means like a, is the line that is able to maximize the variance of your data. The variance here is the distances uh, uh, from the projected point onto this line to the region. So the PC method works in this way. So, well, if you apply this uh, this idea, uh, sorry, <laughs> this is another slide. If you, if you want to see this mathematically speaking, uh, is, 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 is very simple. You have to, to take the covariance matrix, you calculate the agent decomposition, and you will obtain agent vector and agent values. The agent vector will be the new axis of your, of your data, will be the principal components of your data, because they have the intrinsic property to, uh, to, to collect uh, the maximum variant of your data. But also the agent values, as you know, the agent vector has an associated agent values, the edges value uh, uh, we will say which is the direction uh, uh, where you can find the most of dispersion of your data. So in some point here, if you if you order the agent value, you are order the importance of your agent vector. So if you want to get uh, uh, more information about this thing, you can do a ratio between uh, one value over the rest of the agent values. Uh, you will obtain the spleen variant, which is the information that you have in its principal component. So this is worthy because with this, you can uh, describe uh, the information that you have in your data through the principal component that you are obtaining. So well, if you apply this method on, our, uh, on the passer population with the set of variables that I, I was commenting, uh, you obtain this thing. So in this first panel, you see the principal components uh, in function of the spleen variant. So as you see here in the principal component one, 
you see that the 71.6% of display of the variance of the information of your data, which is equivalent, uh, uh, is hosted here in the principal component one. And uh, with the second uh, principal component, you are able to reproduce the remaining variance of your data. So obviously, if you, if you make a total sum of the two one, you see this one, the cumulative uh, split variance. So only with two principal components, that is something uh, we knew. We knew when it, uh, when we started to study this uh, this thing, uh, you are able to reproduce the 100 percent of your information. The third panel uh, will be used to answer the question or the point uh, where I, I, I was I was telling you about the problem that if you have a set of variables, but six of them are depending directly on spin and peri spin period derivative, you can think that. Okay, you are going to obtain two principal components to represent the 100%, but maybe uh, these principal components are the same as spin period, the spin period and spin period derivative. But as you see here, that is not true because this heat map is showing the, the weight of each variable respect to its principal component. And as you see there, uh, the, the weights are non zero respect to uh, each variable. So this is important because if you see, that heat map in a numerical way, these are the, these ones. You can see as the the coefficient uh, uh, close to its uh, variables are non-zero. So this means that if you want to build a principal component one, you have to add all the information that you have in the rest of the variables. Actually, if you see the coefficient here, they are really really similar. I mean, they, there is there is no one adding a uh, 0 0.000. So this is this is something to, to keep in mind. Other thing that you can see here is what is the behavior of its variable respect uh, respect its uh, principal component. So here, uh, for instance, for the PC, PC1, when the PC1 grows, or in other words, when the B surface, for instance, grows, the PC1 decreases. So this is something really good because when you when you when you are doing something using only PC1 and PC2, you can explore this idea only uh, 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 considering the values of the, of the principal components, as you can estimate what uh, behavior the rest of the variables are, are following. So this is something that is, uh, that is behind this, this point. So now, if you open this, quest, uh, this equation and you put PC1 and PC2 only in function of a spin period, of the spin period derivative, uh, you can get uh, this idea. That is something really, really good to demonstrate that uh, the things you see in the PP dot diagram is not the same thing that you see in the PC1, PC2 plane. So if you take uh, this last two, two equation and you create a circle uh, making synthetic pulsar uh, with fake values, and you follow the, the equation of a circle, and then you translate uh, this circle to this plane, the PC1, PC2, you see how the shape of the circle uh, changes uh, is transformed to a uh, rotating ellipse. So this means that the relationship that you see here in the spin period and spin period derivative plane uh, are not the same that you, uh, are not the same uh, relationship that you can extract when you use the PC1, PC2 plane. So what in the top part, you see the, the, the classic uh, PP the diagram with a uh, constant light representing the values of PC1 and PC2. And on the right side, you see the, the plane, uh, the PC1, PC2 plane with constant lines uh, uh, representing the value for the spin and spin period derivative. But this is kind of the idea behind the, uh, the, 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 the application of the PC method on the, on the pulsar population. So there is one important thing that I would like to give you. If you use distant rankings or try to do any kind of visualization using only a spin and spin derivative, you are going to get different information uh, from the from the selection of the rest of the variable that we have been considering today. So this is kind of the idea to 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 give this uh, this point. The way this is the I think this is the core of this project. Uh, this is the graph theory, uh, and now I I am going to 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 give you uh some basic things about this thing uh this guy works so well firstly is um the uh, a graph is a mathematical object composed by nodes and edges 
uh, and these ones are representing the relationship between the, the nodes. So if you have a capital G, uh, a capital G graph, uh, this, this guy uh, is composed by a set of nodes B, uh, denoted by capital B, and a set of edges E, uh, then, uh, denoted by, uh, by a capital E. So well, these edges are assigned uh, with a weight. So this weight, uh, so the relationship between, between uh, two nodes, but in our case, this weight uh, will be the Euclidean distance between the pulsars. So for that reason, uh, uh, I, I was uh, trying to, to, to give you a clear, observe, uh, a clear situation about the variable we are going to consider, because if you want to apply this equation, you have to, to, to keep in mind the variable that you are going to, to use. Well, this is uh, an example about uh, about a graph. Here you you have a graph composed by 158 nodes and 12,403 uh, 12, edges. So <clears throat> this is a complete and directly and weighted graph. Uh, so it's complete because uh, if you define a sequence, uh, a part of a graph as a sequence of nodes uh, uh, without taking uh, to uh, one pulse at twice. <laughs> Uh, is complete because uh, you are able to go from one node to another one without any problem. It's undirected because if you want to go from node one to node two, it's the same that if you want to go uh, from one from node two to node one. So if you if you measure the distance uh, between the two nodes, it's the same if you if you see this distance from uh, from this guy to this one or vice versa. But also it's weighted because if you take all the weights that you have uh, in your graph, all the edges that uh, I saw you, that all uh, the edges in this graph are, are assigned by, uh, by, uh, by a weight, uh, as you make a total sum of these weights, you obtain a, a final value, which is the weight of the, of the graph. This is kind of uh, an example about, uh, about uh, uh, a typical graph. A couple more things about this. This is not really, really, really interesting for this project. But I, I, I totally sure that if you if you read something about graph theory or something like that, it's really important to know uh, that the degree of a node is the is the number of edges that one node uh, has connected to itself, because this is a, a, a kind of a score that the graph theory uses a lot. So it's important to 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 get an idea about that. But also the adjacency matrix, because the adjacency matrix is a way to reproduce mathematically uh, the the things you see when you when you plot a graph. So it's the like at the back end of the graph. So so words uh, really easy, but 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 it's really interesting because if you see a graph and you see how the two nodes are connected between each other. Well. See, participating in the talk. Okay. Um, well, yeah, if you see a graph and you see that two nodes are connected between each other, and you go, and you go to the to 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 see what's going on in the that the sensing matrix, that the sensing matrix has the dimension of uh, capital V multiplied by capital V. So if you want to find uh, where uh, where is that connection, you want to you 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 have to take uh, the column. Which is representing one node. You sorry the, the row. Uh, you have to take the column which is representing the other node. As you go to that element, uh, you will find that that element is non-zero. Is different. Is is represented by a value. So in some cases, you can find that that value is one because it's representing only the connection. But in other cases, you can find that that value is the weight, uh, which uh, was assigned to to the, to this edge. But this is something to, to, to know that it's not really important for this project, but I think it's good to know about this thing. So, well, this is the minimum in part three. This is, I think, the most important one here. So, well, the, the, the minimum in part three or the MST is a subgraph of, uh, of a graph of a capital G uh, that is able to, uh, to get the smallest weight that a graph has. So if you take a graph and you reproduce a subgraph taking all the nodes and you try to connect all the nodes in, in a random way, 
And you make a sum, you obtain a, 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 a final weight, which is assigned to this graph. So while well, the minimum corresponding tree does this thing, but getting the smallest weight. So this is something really good because in somehow the MST is able to connect all the nodes, considering the smallest weight between two nodes at a local level, but considering what's going on uh, in, a, in a global situation. So it's like a, apply something, it's like apply a optimization technique. So for that reason, if you have a, a something like this, a complete and direct graph with 150 is no, and 12,400 edges, you can obtain this thing. This guy is the MST of this graph. So how, is, how are, are we able to, to, to move from this one to this one? through the, the, the algorithm that I explained in, in that part. This is the crucial algorithm. This is a kind of greedy algorithm, uh, which is able to reproduce or to, con to, to get MSTs. So the, the way is, 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 is really simple. It, the, this guy orders the, the edges in an increasing weight, take uh, the smallest one uh, until he finds that one of one edge uh, is creating a cycle in your graph. When, when this algorithm finds that thing, reject, uh, reject that edge and goes to the next one until uh, he is able, uh, it's, it's able to connect all the nodes. So this is something that, that equation, this is something that comes from, from the graph theory. The MST is always able to do that using a number of edges uh, equals to the number of nodes you have minus one. So here, if you see, if you see the legend, uh, you can see 158 nodes, 12,503 uh, edges or two edges, I don't remember well, because here you are connecting all the nodes between each other. When you apply the MST, the crucial algorithm to obtain the MST, you obtain 158 nodes because you are connecting all the nodes with only using 157 edges. So this is something really good. So, well, the point here is this. Uh, we are going to move from this thing, from this guy that is really useful, really, really, really useful to this guy, which is the, the MST of the pulsar population. So here we have 2,509 pulsar, but only using 2,507 edges. So this is the, the the main point on this on this uh, on this part. So well, now I, I I'm going to give you uh, a sort of detail uh, on how you can read the MST because I know that it's something really new and maybe it's like okay what what what's, what's going on what's going on. So well, uh, the first thing uh, was to try to demonstrate that the MST had uh, had physical meaning. So to do that, uh, we were exploring different parts uh, of the MST. And this is something really interesting because if you take a, a local group of pulsar or if you take a sequence of, of nodes and you track the variables uh, uh, that, that, uh, that were defi defined uh, for, for, for the MST, and you track the variables and you see what's going on with those variables, you obtain these kind of things. You have ten scatter plots, so you, you you cannot read anything if you take groups in a random way, or if you take sequence of nodes in a random way, you can't uh, see anything. But it is interesting because it's not the same when you do the same process when you take the same sequence of nodes, but you follow the order of the nodes that the MST offers, you see this plot. The smooth behavior is, 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 is amazing. So this is something that uh, uh, we were considering because it's a way to show that the MST is, saying, is, is telling us something. Because when you do the same in a, in, a, in a random way, you cannot read anything, but when you read the same sequences of note in, a, in an ordered manner, you see this thing. So it's incredible because taking the same sequence of note, the same, you say you take the same and you you do this in a random way, you obtain this plot. But when you do the same uh, in an order manner, following the order manner that the MST says, you obtain uh, this plot. 
So we think that this is a, 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 a good way to show that the MST has physical meaning. So something really close to the PP diagram, we think that uh, we can demonstrate that if you take a group of pulsar, uh, considering only the, the nearness of this pulsar, but in the PP dot diagram, as you, try, uh, as you move this group to, to the MST, you are taking something like uh, the, the, that group of pulsar or that, that important branch of the MST that you can see there, well, you obtain the same. So in so how uh, we are trying to say that the, if you take a sequence of nodes uh, following that the MST say, uh, maybe you can get new information or you can get other kind of information than the things you see when you apply, uh, when you take something uh, directly from the PP of diagram. So well, uh, this is other thing that you can you can do with the MST, and this is other way to show that the MST can have uh, can have uh, uh, physical meaning. When you take the variable that uh, that uh, that you are using to to create the MST, and you make a range in those variables, and then you take the groups uh, associated to to those range, and you see where they are followed into the MST, you can see how uh, uh, most of the time uh, they are grouping in the same part together. Uh, they are grouping in the same part of the MST together. So this is interesting because, for instance, if you see the bizarre fields and you take the, the highest values of the, of the bizarre fields, you take those, those, those parts that are magnetized, uh, you see how they are falling into this part, in this branch. So this is interesting because you can think that, okay, maybe the MST uh, reproduce the pulsar PP dot, but you know, using whatever reason, but no, it's able to, to, to split uh, the MST in different parts, uh, considering the variables that, that, that you are taking. So this is something really good. But also you can say, you can see the same by using directly classes of pulsar. So if you take magnetars directly as classes of, as a class of pulsar, and you see where they are falling uh, into the MST, you see that they are in this part. But also the low field magnetar and those ones, those ones are a bit different from those ones, but they are together in the same part. So, so this is other way to, to show the same thing. Now, Sorry, uh, yeah. Can I ask something? Because uh, in here, in this plane, you're plotting a projection of the minimum spanning tree in the various dimensions of the data, right? Yeah. Okay, uh, so these are uh, yeah. uh, sorry, components. especially here. I mean, the point here is like, uh, well, I tried to explain with the principal components is the same. I mean, if you take PC1 and PC2, you are reproducing the 100% of your data, the data res uh, uh, respect to the variable yeah. you have. So if you use eight variables to create the MST, or you take PC1 and PC2, you obtain the same. So, so, so you're using two dimensions. But, but 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 to create this, what well, the point that the, with the graph is that the graph has no dimensions. That's that's the point. I mean, in terms of uh, of plotting the graph, it it has in dimension. The only dimension you are adding to this graph is in terms of the variable that you are using to create the weights between the the parts. This is the only kind of dimension. But it's true that uh, here. Uh, uh, with this set of variables, uh, we have to be careful with the, the part of dimension. Because when you take a graph for, for whatever reason, uh, to do whatever you want, and you take a set of variables, uh, these variables are independent between each other. From my point of view, yeah, you are using n dimensions and you are creating a graph to recreate something in n dimension. That, that is something really good because you are creating relationship between the, between the nodes. So that is something that you cannot uh, do if you take a basic plot. So for that reason, the graphs are very powerful. But here is not the same. Uh, uh, from my point of view, it's not the same because you are considering eight variables. So there's something really close to say eight dimension, but it's not totally true, I think, because you are taking eight variables, but they are six depending literally on two ones. So it's like a something really close to have a two dimension problem. But in other way, so I think that's the point. So probably for that reason, when you take the log of the variables, and then you calculate the, the, the PC method on this variable to know that you are going to obtain PC1 and PC2 
and with these two principal components, are you uh, are you be able are you able to reproduce a one hundred percent of the variant? Because geometrically speaking, it's like uh, if you take all the three variables, p surface, spin period, spin period derivative, and you open the p surface uh, in function of a spin period, a spin period derivative, take it log, and you, you see what happened with that part. You see that you are creating a plane. You are creating a plane in three dimensions because you are considering this surface as a component, then you find a constant, and then you find other variables. So this is the same equation of a plane. So here, I think that when you when you take eight variables and six of them depend only two, on two variables, you are creating a plane in a lot of dimension, but it's a plane. So for that reason, when you apply the PC method, the variance falling into a plane. So you just need to have two principal components to reproduce all this all these variables. So this is the, the thing. Mm -hmm. Well, here this is other uh, other kind of uh, use you can you can do with the MST. If you if you use this as an alerting tool, well, you can consider that the the, the closeness be uh, neighbors that you that you find here uh, really close to the low field magnetic uh, low uh, low field magnetic field. I don't know low magnetic field. Yeah, okay, <laughs> sorry. Uh, uh, you, you can explore what's going on with the parts are closest uh, to, to, to each other because maybe uh, it's interesting to see why the MST uh, is capturing the spots are in, 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 in this region. So this is the same uh, when you when you take a look at the pulsar with nebula. So when you plot all the pulsar with nebula you have in the 18 catalog, you see that they are falling into the same part in this region. So maybe it's, it's interesting to explore what's going on with the rest of the pulsar that they are falling into the same region because maybe they, uh, I don't know, they are showing something really close to pulsar with nebula or, or whatever. Uh, this is something we are exploring now, but in general, I think that this is, is good. If someone wants to take a look at this, it's super welcome. <laughs> so, well, this is the, um, the, the second paper uh, we have submitted uh, uh, one week ago, this is really related to the part of uh, having all the potential that the graph theory uh, 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 has. Because here we are trying to uh, split our MST in different significant parts. So and to do that, uh, we use between the centrality, this is a central estimator, to see how, uh, how the, the central node is respect to the to the to the whole population so when you do that you can uh, point out uh one central uh what what is the amount of nodes uh that are falling in the central part and they're defining a branch for us a significant branch is um is a group of pulsar uh which uh which is departing from the from the central part and it has um a minimum percentage of nodes respect to the total population, but also when you do all these things and you obtain uh, a couple of branches, uh, we apply a non-parametric stress, a non-parametric parametric test uh, to, to, to see if they are representing in somehow different behavior uh, regarding the variables that we are using to, to create this. So if you do all these things, uh, firstly, you obtain uh, the MST uh, with the with the uh, uh, representing the the, the between the centrality. As you see here, this part is by eye. You can easily to see what what is the central part, and then applying something that uh, that I commented, but other thing that you can find in 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 that uh, in this paper, uh, you obtain uh, seven significant branches. So maybe uh, the significant branches are appearing in, in that way because they are representing a subpopulation, something new or something that we know, but that uh, could be good to uh, take a look at them. So this is kind of the idea uh, behind this uh, new way to, 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 to split the MSD. But uh, other thing that for me is really, really important here is um, when you go to 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 look for information in graph theory, it's really difficult to 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 find something to compare different MST or different graphs. 
there is nothing I say. Uh, I don't know why, but there is nothing. I, I think that because the graph theory is a is a is a complete uh, is a complete theory. But but if you want to do something in a really specific way, you have to create it. So that's something really good, but it's a problem when you you know when you have to do something quickly. So with this, if you are able to separate uh, your MST uh, in different important uh, parts. Probably you can compare different MST digitally or different graphs. So this is something worthy if you want to do probably something with a synthetic population or different kind of population, but are using the same kind of variables. So for that reason, I think that this, this approach is uh, would be really worth it for, for, for those purposes. So and all the things that you can find in that paper, but uh, that you can uh, obtain using the idea that uh, I was commenting, uh, is uh, if you take the, the, the pulsar population and you take the date variable uh, and you split your, your data using the, the date, uh, this date, uh, which is uh, represented when uh, the pulsar were uh, incorporated in the 18th catalog, and you split uh, uh, by epochs uh, this variable, you obtain, you, well, you can obtain different samples and then you can create different MST using those samples. So well, something interesting is to project these branches uh, into the different epochs to see how the nodes were uh, uh, growing together uh, throughout the history. Because with this, with the togetherness, uh, we try to show that the what is the percentage of nodes uh, of one significant branch uh, were together or how uh, they were uh, together in the different epochs and in, in which kind of uh in which in which value you can find that. So it's is is something uh that could be worthy because again if you want to compare uh directly to MST you can use this idea. You can you can see what happened directly between the pulsar that you that you see in the different branches in the in the different significant branches that you have in both MST. So but this is this is only a uh, other approach that you can use using graph theory. Well, now I, I, I'm going to introduce a little bit uh, this tool. Uh, <laughs> this is really good because this is a tool that uh, we have been uh, uh, developing for six months and has been a bit tough. So please uh, take a look at it because it's good. Uh, so, but the idea behind this is simple. That is it's something to, to recreate, to reproduce and to explore different things by using MST and, and the PP that they are at the same time. So and you can get these functionalities and you can put the labels in both in both diagrams and you can change the the, the axis of the PP the diagram to see how the the, the pulsar population change with respect to the variable that that we are considering. Also, you can set the different characteristics. This is the, uh, these are the, the range of the variables that uh, I was commenting on. But also you can, you can plot uh, both uh, here and there. Uh, there's, uh, there's different classes of pulsar uh, we, have been, uh, we have been considering for this project. Um, two, two, two more things, you can even you can uh, look for any pulse that you have, uh, you want using the pulsar finder, but also you can set your own uh, range of your variables uh, to see uh, how the, the 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 variables are falling into the MST, but also in the in the in the PP that they are. And you can select whatever you want, and then you can develop uh, those data frames. So maybe it's, it's worth it. You want to explore what's going on uh, in the MST. That that would be nice. But also, if you want to see something in the PP diagram. So well, now uh, uh, conclusion about this. Uh, I think the first thing is really simple. Our idea was, and our idea is now, is that if you give new ways to visualize a, a, a something, probably you can obtain new perspective about that. So we are trying to to in so how to see that if we are able to visualize the same thing, but in another way, probably. We can get new information or the same information, but trying to interpret this one in in other way. So this is, I think, the the main idea behind this. So the rest of the things are related to 
well, if you go to the graph theory and you take something as the, the, the between the centrality, you can raise something really close to the second so to the second paper we have submitted be because there are other uh other powerful things there that can be useful for 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 dealing with the pulsar population but also if you do that you can maybe i don't know deal with the with the with synthetic population to see uh what differences uh you can find uh when you compare two synthetic population by using graph theory and also and that is something really obvious that if you change the catalog you are using you can get different information because maybe you have uh other purposes so if you if you change the catalog you 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 can see other things but the same uh with the variables because uh for for getting this uh we decide to get the biggest uh the biggest data uh, data that uh we could but maybe uh, you, you, you want to be focused on only one part of the PP diagram. Now for that, for those parts are, uh, you know, uh, you have uh, different values that, uh, that, they are, that they are known. So maybe uh, you can obtain different, different things. And I think that that is all. So questions? Yes, uh, thank you very much. This is very interesting. Uh, thank you. Um, about the comparability of minimum spanning trees with population synthesis, uh, or trying to get different catalogs. Um, I would worry what what is the effect of uncertainties or observational biases? For for example, in a synthetic population, you might feel a lot of space in the in the in a lot of the parameter space. But on the other hand, it's difficult to measure periods or be dots for specific cases. So in this case, you wonder whether the over density is because of observational biases or uncertainties who change the structure of the minimum spanning tree. Well, and the problem with that is only that uh, the variables that you are considering uh, uh, have effect directly in the weight, only in the weight. Uh, so the weight is assigned to every edge. So if you want to uh, create an MST, there is no problem. I mean, the, the MST doesn't care anything about that. The only point is the, the things you, you want to extract from that. Because you can create an MST and you know, using the graph theory, that the MST is unique always that you, uh, if you always have uh, different weights, you are always obtain, uh, to obtain the same, uh, you will always obtain the same MST. So this is no problem. So regarding the MST, there is no problem. The problem is uh, that you are creating uh, this MST or the weights using the Euclidean distance. So if you take the Euclidean distance and you put there uh, strain variables or weight variables, or you don't know anything if that variable is the best or whatever, you, know, you will have problems to interpret properly the, the, the things you see in the MST. This is barely the idea. Because for that reason, when uh, when I, I was showing you the, the part related to the variables, there, uh, there there are really interesting variables. But the problem is most of the variables that you have there, uh, there are now uh, for, for the most of the pulsar. So you are going to create all the animals maybe with, I don't know, 10 pulsar. So this is not really interesting. At least for now, no, because uh, we wanted to know that this, this, this idea is only uh, was only a good exercise, or maybe is is worth it. So now, if you take, for instance, the Fermi catalog, and you take uh, uh, carefully the variables, and you 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 make sure that those variables are working, well, you can create an MST. You can see what's going on, and you can try to interpret the information that the MST offers. But if you add where variables are, uh, if you reduce too much your your data set, the MST that you are going to obtain maybe is not the uh, not really worth it. Did, did you try to use graph operators to see classes, for example, pruning to remove noise or no. dense regions or cutting? Not for now, but maybe it's worth it. Okay, you can describe. Yeah, totally. Yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe it's worth it to take a look at it. Because for now, it was uh, uh, we did this uh, in a really basic basic way. I think that taking the variable that we know, uh, I think that we know uh, 
quite well how how the what, what kind of behavior this variable have, and then trying to get a really good uh, data set of pulse, and then to create the MST, and you see okay, well this these are the magnet, and these are the low field, these are the whatever. But now that we know that it it is working, then maybe that is a really good uh, path to explore. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So any other questions? Um, thank you very much. Your thank you, Nana. Um, I have a question. So in practice, this can be done whatever structure block you have. You have two variables and you do your MST right. Now, in the case you are applying it, the PN and dodge, which is the typical also planes, we know that the two variables are basically related. So you may have whatever to dodge for whatever to do for a physical reason, which is the evolution of the field. Of the two is more or less more. And we know that it's not even the same for sources which are there or down there. So it's they are correlated in a different manner depending on the different sources. So what happens if you take two variables, I don't know, period and position and graph in the in the in the dance, for example, which are not correlated. Which in this case we know are not correlated, but you might not know. Let's say in other cases, what happened to the proving of this? With, with respect to the MST that you can get uh, using that. Well, that is really interesting because when you use uncorrelated variables, um, well, firstly, the interpretation that you have are really different from the from the basic way because they are uh, making a con connection between the pulsar, but using something that is not really easy to interpret. But well, the point is you are going to obtain an MST that this is really true. And then the part, uh, the interesting part will be uh, try to explore uh, the different parts you see in the MST. Firstly, uh, using the, the tracking of the variables to see what's going on. Because I am totally sure that you are going to obtain something really smooth because the MST, when you do that, is like I is able to connect all this thing uh, following an idea behind the variables. But maybe the most interesting thing when you do that is to see what's happening in terms of uh, subpopulation using the second part I saw you. Uh, see, try if we are able to split the MST in different significant parts and see what's happening with there. Maybe taking subpopulation and study the, the, I don't know if the behavior, but if there is some kind of connection behind them, uh, for that reason, the MST uh, connects all the nodes together in, in some part. But the point when you are when you use uncorrelated uh, variables is that at even if you take the PCA, you need to uh, uh, use all the pieces, all the principal components to add all the information you have. So the MST uh, will be really different from the idea that we have when you use uh, uh, correlated variables. Because when you we are here, when we are considering correlated variables. I think that we we knew from the beginning something that uh, could occur because I just see, I just say that if you see the PP dot we know that what happened with the PP dot But maybe when you use uh, uncorrelated variables, you obtain something a bit weird and a bit interesting to explore. But the point is that yes, it's true that we know what happens more or less with the PP diagram, but we have a mix of things. One is our modeling. And one is our observational bias. Those two things are very difficult to disentangle completely. We would love to be able, to, yeah. in the sense that we don't know if a certain part of the development is empty because it's the physics that does not predict those sources. I mean, people don't know totally genetic evidence, or it's because we are not good enough to observe the sources. Now, this information. I guess get completely mixed in your tree, right? You cannot design angle even less. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, yeah, totally. I mean, the point is that the MST is only taking the things that you know respect to that. I mean, because it, it's creating the connection between the pulse are using the noun spin period, that spin period. They, 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 so that is true. It's, it doesn't say anything about the empty part or why those parts are empty or why. So assume that your sample is complete. Yeah. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, for this approach, uh, that is the idea. I mean, maybe if you if maybe it's worth it to explore something that uh, you are commenting now that because with this thing, I think that we try to 
check <laughs> or that the, the MST has something that we know. Because maybe if you create an MST and you see what's going on and you see really different things from the PP diagram, but only the same thing, it's like, okay, maybe this is something really weird. Maybe it's amazing because you are able to explore whatever, but I think that is not a really good, good thing. But now that we know that, okay, this is a, as the creative tool works uh, quite well, as an alerting tool, we have to explore it. So maybe now is the point that maybe it's worth it to explore what happened with uh, unrelated variables. Maybe uh, we create different connection and maybe it's, it's, it's good to see because for now, yes, for now it's totally model depending, <laughs> totally. Uh, but I think that the, that, that was the, the, the good, uh, that was a good idea. Because if not, maybe we were exploring something really where uh, uh, we didn't know where uh, where this thing uh, uh, could go. That's the point. Thank you. Any other questions? So what's the the weights between the nodes? Well, the weights uh, that uh, there are between different, the different nodes, what do they represent? The weights, yeah. the Euclidean distance uh, on the variables that we are uh, considering. So in this case, it's something really... Are eh? low, lower weights than things that they are broken. Well, this is something, a philosophical question, I think. Yeah, the Euclidean distance tries to measure the... Well, yeah, some people can say that, yeah, the similarity between two parts are, I, I think so. I think that is a good approach. If you want to measure the similarity between two things, uh, if you if you, if you measure the, the Euclidean distance between these two things uh, respect to the, the variable uh, where they are operating. So yeah, it's a, it's a way to say that they are really close. But I think that is a philosophical question because other people can say, no, this is, I think I think the confusion is because uh, you say the distance, but it's probably the weight related to the inverse of the distance, right? No, I mean if I say that, that is, that is wrong. I mean no, the the distance between two point two nodes is based on the Euclidean distance between the two nodes. So in this case, if we are using eight variables, we we put the eight variables inside the equation and you obtain the the weight. I don't know if I say other things. Sorry, because I, I made a mistake. But I mean, when you constructed these things, yeah. you said that you were looking for the path with the minimum weight. Yeah, I mean, the, but you, you are you are telling about the the crucial algorithm to create the MST, right? So yeah, the the crucial algorithm. I mean, you you have a complete graph uh, with all the weights in your graph that is uh, based on the Euclidean distance, and the crucial algorithm uh, orders uh, this this weight in an increasing weight. And then picks up the, the first one, and then the second one, and then the second one. When this this guy finds that one way, the one edge that uh, that has selected, uh, create a cycle, uh, re reject this edge, and goes to the next one. So this is uh, is 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 really is really is really nice because when you do this uh, by hand. It's amazing because always is able to to create a, a, a subgraph, connected all the nodes, getting the smallest uh, total weight of the graph. This is a proof that you can demonstrate using graph theory. But there are other algorithms to this to this uh, to do this thing. Prince algorithm, Boluska, there are others. But we choose this because we think that it's a bit better in terms of computational cost. Any other questions? Maybe we can check if there is any question in, uh, in the chat. Oh, sorry, because I didn't see anything. And the worst uh, speaker ever. <laughs> I don't know. I, I didn't see anything. Yeah, I guess there's no. No, it's not festival. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe Alba knows something about it. <laughs> Let's say, I guess we could see it. No. no. Okay. There is no questions in the chat for the moment. Uh, there are no questions okay. in the chat, so it's okay. okay. It's, uh, yes. it's perfect. Ah, okay. Yeah. Oh, 
thank you for the presentation, but it's just something I, I need the first five first five minutes. So I don't know if you remember new things that have been missing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I missed it. Sorry. Yeah, so yeah, I yeah, wanted yeah. To say something, but okay, yes. somebody else then. Yeah, I have no problem. So yeah, you can probably yeah. Yeah, don't don't thank yeah. you. I like it very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. No, just uh, because the, usually we say maybe new member, right, and so on. So we have in our group, in the group of Christine and myself, the Nucleus and Astroparticle Physics Group, a new PhD student. Some of you know him already, but in case that you know that he's around, so Luis, so Luis Hernandez, so he is in the, uh, in the second floor, and he's going to work about transport theory and commuting stars, merger, and all this. So. Mm -hmm. So okay, yeah. just mm -hmm. that you know that he's around. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Welcome. Uh, so yes, we can go to have some pizza. <laughs> hey, please. <laughs> okay. So yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for coming.